Hi friends, welcome back to online English class. Um, the first thing that I want you guys to do this week is click on the Microsoft form link that I left for you on our It's Learning page to let me know how you are doing. Um, this week our mini lesson is on looking at literary devices and their impacts. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is remind you that literary devices are craft moves. So we're going to go over some common literary devices just to remind you what they do and look at some examples. So first, alliteration, and that's the repetition of initial consonant sounds. And there's some examples down there below. Repetition, repeating the same word, phrase, or sentence. You guys know this one and you use it all the time. Parallelism, this one's newer, but we're getting better at recognizing and using it in our writing. That's the repetition of the same pattern of words or phrases. Um, so the first example here, I came to win, to fight, to conquer, to thrive, so the repeated sentence structure or phrase structure, I guess I mean. You know what I mean. Allusion, a direct or indirect reference. So from Dark Horse by Katy Perry, Make Me Your Aphrodite, she's got an allusion there to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Metaphors were pros at recognizing metaphors and similes. That's a comparison without the use of like or as. So you are this, you are that. My heart's a stereo. So comparing two things by just saying that it is that thing. And then a simile is when you do use like or as. All right, hyperbole, that's our exaggeration or overstatement for emphasis. Personification is giving human qualities to animals, objects, or ideas, and it's only human qualities to those things. All right, so those are the most commonly seen craft moves, but I wanted to make a list of some other ones that we use in class. So we've got the single sentence paragraph, the M dash, that long dash, and to use that, you just click the dash button two times, type whatever letter you're going to use, and then press the space button, and it makes it long. Um, and ellipses, that's what we call the dot, dot, dot. Um, using bold, italics, or underline. Throwing in some parentheses. Um, slashing. I've only ever seen this used in the Shatter Me series, but I think it's really cool. Um, organization, sentence style. Um, unique voice and tone. So these are all things that we in class have seen and used in our writing to kind of jazz it up. So we're going to look at a mentor text. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to look at some craft moves and just kind of discuss their impact for me as a reader. So this is from Gone Girl by Jillian Flynn. Quiet. The complex was always disturbingly quiet. As I neared our home, conscious of the noise of the car engine, I could see the cat was definitely still on the steps. Still on the steps, 20 minutes after Carl's call. That was strange. Amy loved the cat. The cat was declawed. The cat was never let outside. Never, ever. Because the cat, Bleaker, was sweet but extremely stupid. And despite the low jack trafficking device pelleted somewhere in his furry fat rolls, Amy knew she'd never see the cat again if he ever got out. The cat would waddle straight into the Mississippi River. Deedle dee dum and float all the way to the Gulf of Mexico into the maw of a hungry bull shark. But it turned out that the cat wasn't even smart enough to get past the steps. Bleaker was perched on the edge of the porch, a pudgy but proud sentinel, private tryhard. As I pulled into the drive, Carl came out and stood on his own front steps, and I could feel the cat and the old man both watching me as I got out of the car and walked toward the house the red peonies along the border looking fat and juicy, asking to be devoured. I was about to go into a blocking position to get the cat when I saw that the front door was open. Carl had said as much, but seeing it was different. This wasn't taking out the trash back in a minute open. This was wide, gaping, ominous open. Carl hovered across the way, waiting for my response, and like some awful piece of performance art, I felt myself an acting concerned husband. I stood on the middle step and frowned, then took the stairs quickly, two at a time, calling out my wife's name. Silence. Amy, you home? I ran upstairs. No Amy. The ironing board was set up, the iron still on, a dress waiting to be pressed. Amy? 
As I ran back downstairs, I could see Carl still framed in the open doorway, hands on hips, watching. I swerved into the living room and pulled up short. The carpet glinted with shards of glass. The coffee table shattered. End tables were on their sides. Books slid across the floor like a card trick. Even the heavy antique ottoman was belly up, its four tiny feet in the air like something dead. In the middle of the mess was a pair of good sharp scissors. Amy? I began running, bellowing her name, through the kitchen where a tea kettle was burning, down to the basement where the guest room stood empty, and then out the back door. I pounded across our yard onto the slender boat deck leading out over the river. I peeked over the side to see if she was in our rowboat, where I had found her one day, tethered to the dock, rocking in the water, her face to the sun, eyes closed. And as I'd peered down into the dazzling reflections of the river at her beautiful, still face, she'd suddenly opened her blue eyes and said nothing to me, and I'd said nothing back and gone into the house alone. Amy? She wasn't on the water. She wasn't in the house. Amy was not there. Amy was gone. Okay. Um... So the first thing I want to point out is how he opens with just the word quiet as a sentence all by itself. Um, I feel like that kind of sets the tone for this creepy, panicked scene that we're about to be walked through. Um, the first time I recognize that something is definitely wrong is this sentence here where he just says, that was strange. Um, but it's in between description and background information. So he kind of gives you a little bit of... Um, like, back and forth really, really fast. There's humor laced in all of the panic, um, like this discussion about the cat and giving you that onomatopoeia there um, with the idea of the cat being eaten by a shark. Um, it makes it a little bit lighthearted and takes you away from the panic of the situation, like he's still trying to think positive. Um, he compares the cat to Private Tryhard or some kind of soldier that metaphor there. Um, the red peonies get some personification. Um, I didn't really understand the inclusion of that. So if you want to comment on that and let me know what you think, please do. I thought it was kind of weird and out of place and all the like panic and then hoping for the best. Um, I liked the way he used the little hyphens here to describe something that's kind of difficult to describe. Um, the door being wide, gaping, ominous open um, is something that I can visualize, and it gives you that image. Um, it makes you a little bit nervous comparing it to that um, taking out the trash back in a minute open that I can also visualize. Um, so that kind of helps you set the stage for how it's about to get even more increasingly panicked and nerve-wracking. Like some awful piece of performance art, he compares himself to an acting concerned husband. I like the way he capitalized concerned husband because it's kind of like a stereotype um, or a character that I can imagine seeing in a movie. And him doing that helps me immediately connect to all of those other characters that I've thought of so I can visualize kind of how he's acting. That single sentence, single word paragraph there kind of makes your stomach drop a little bit helps you know that something's definitely not right and that it's possibly that something's very, very wrong with Amy. He gives us very, very good description to let you know that something's definitely wrong and that she wasn't, she didn't leave on purpose or that something was definitely amiss, um, considering that the ironing board is still on. There's a dress waiting to be pressed, that little bit of personification. Dresses can't really wait. Um... The carpet glinting with shards of glass. The coffee table shattered and tables on their sides. Books slid across the floor like a card trick. He gives us similes inside all of this imagery that helps you visualize um, a room where it looks like there was a struggle, something that went wrong. The tea kettle is still burning. The guest room is standing empty. He's providing all of this really specific description to let us know that there's something very, very wrong with this situation. And then we've got a few more single sentence paragraphs down here to settle in that panic. So here's what I want you to do next. Um, now that you've looked through one mentor text, I want you to move on to activity three. You'll be analyzing a selection of your choosing. Your analysis is going to discuss how the choices the author made impacted you as a reader. 
You should identify and explain the impact of the literary devices that you choose, and you'll write this in the form of an analytical paragraph or an SAR. I'm going to write my own answer on Gone Girl, the mentor text, so that you'll have something to look at as an example, um, but you'll write based on something that you read this week, be it a short story or the book that you're reading, um, or if you need something to read, let me know and I can shoot you over a mentor text that you can read and analyze for this week. Um, last minute reminders, let me know if you need help. Um, I love you and I'm always here for you. Send me your siblings or friends if they need any help. Let me know if you need help finding something to read. Feel free to send me your questions, comments, or even just an email to chat and say hi. And that's it for this week. Let me know if you need help. Bye, guys.